Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel and for a show we call On Our Mind. And I'm very pleased today to be with uh, a person who has played a defining role in the evolution of our ideas about the chemistry of living systems and the chemistry of the brain. And beyond that, has made important contributions to understanding where this whole study of brain chemistry may go in the decades ahead. I'm with Jean-Pierre jean Jo. Nice I'm you. so Always pleased to have you with me. Um, Jean-Pierre, I wanted to capture a little bit of the breadth of your experience and contributions by noting, as is made clear in a series of articles that I've looked at recently, I'll quote, but I'll, I'll summarize at a lay level. Up to the early 1950s, ideas concerning how it is that cells worked were dominated by the concept that one molecule would specifically fit into another molecule and cause a change. But that a, an important shift took place in the 50s with the idea that metabolic control may well involve not simply lock and key, but lock and key followed by other locks and keys that were opened subsequently by a change in the shape of molecules that allowed regulators to control the level of activity. And that, that's a concept of Alistair with, for which you've had a huge role. And I want to stop there to get a sense of you about those times and your activities as a young scientist. And then we'll bring it forward to today later. So please, tell us about your life and times in the early 50s, what you were doing, and how your work progressed. Well, I uh, um, started by uh, being a, a marine biologist. And uh, I had a program of research in mind. And uh, when I met uh, Jacques Monod, uh, who uh, had not yet the Nobel Prize, but uh, who had it uh, later on. Uh, I said I want to work on the chemistry of uh, uh, the embryonic development uh, for uh, parasitic organisms, parasites, which are very unusual kind of uh, organisms. And uh, he said to me, uh, don't work on that. Uh, it's not the moment. Uh, I think the time is to work with simpler organisms, bacteria, and to try to elucidate the basic mechanism, how these bacteria work at the molecular level. And uh, among the uh, several um, projects for uh, my thesis, uh, he gave me with uh, uh, François Jacob, uh, they were um, uh, possibilities to work on the genetics of bacteria. And there were also uh, mention of uh, a work recently done by Edwin Umberger in bacteria. And uh, Umberger discovered that uh, in bacteria there are uh, chains of uh, uh, chemical reactions which uh, uh, result by the production of a compound which is used as a building block of the bacteria, an amino acid, l -isoleucine. And uh, Umberger had found that uh, this factory is in fact regulated by the end product of the pathway and inhibit the first enzyme. So you stop the chain by having the first steps inhibited. Beautiful negative feedback. It's a negative feedback. And uh, the, I was very interested by uh, the problem. And um, I uh, started to think about it. And uh, indeed, it's a very interesting uh, molecular problem. Because with an enzyme, we have a catalytic site where the substrate is binding. And now we have a feedback inhibitor which is coming to inhibit this enzyme. The first thing we may think about is that the feedback inhibitor takes the place of uh, the substrate. It's a false key mm -hmm. to open. False the key. It, it does yes. not uh, mm -hmm. work 
mm -hmm. anymore to open uh, the lock. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was surprised by this because the substrate and the end product are very different. And therefore, <coughs> the idea I had already in mind was that possibly there was a special site for the feedback inhibitor, which was present on this enzyme. That in fact, there was some kind of switch mm -hmm. which was triggered by the regulatory signal and changing the catalytic activity of the enzyme through a conformation change. Right. So the notion of uh, allosteric interaction came out of uh, uh, this uh, early observation and from uh, also uh, another observation I made uh, at the beginning of our stasis work, which is that one can uncouple the catalytic activity and the feedback inhibition. So you have an enzyme which is active and no longer regulated. Mm -hmm. So you miss the regulatory switch, even though you are still the biological activity. And uh, <clears throat> from this observation, uh, I propose the uh, scheme according to which there would be two sites interacting, one for the substrate and the other for the feedback inhibitor, and that they would communicate indirectly mm -hmm. one with the other. Mm -hmm. And this was named in uh, the conclusion of the meeting where I presented uh, these data for the first time at Cold Spring Harbor in 1961. This uh, kind of interaction was named by Mono and Jacob Allosteric. They found the name for the model I had proposed at the meeting. Exciting. So uh, the continuation of the work showed that the things were even more complex, that uh, these regulatory enzymes were uh, organized with symmetry properties, that they were cooperative aspects, which mean that uh, instead of having a gradual change, there was a all or none change of uh, the activity of, of the protein, a, a switch, mm. a commutation. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we propose together with uh, Jeffrey Zweiman and Jacques Monod, uh, a model which has been very popular since then, and um, it became one of the most quoted publications in the, mm -hmm. these times, and uh, which give uh, some kind of general scheme for these uh, regulatory devices. At the end of my um, uh, PhD thesis, uh, I proposed, took the risk, to say that possibly <laughs> this kind of mechanism could work in the brain and at the level of synaptic transmission. It would no longer be intracellular regulation, like in, within the bacterial cell, right. but communication between cells, mm -hmm. between nerve cells at the level of uh, the device, which is called a synapse. Right. And the regulatory signal would not be anymore the feedback inhibitor, but would be a neurotransmitter. And everybody knows what a neurotransmitter is. It's a chemical substance like acetylcholine, norepinephrine, uh, glutamate, GABA, and so on, which uh, are synthesized by nerve cells and are used uh, to communicate with another cell through release in a cleft, mm -hmm. which is called the synaptic cleft. And there, in the synaptic cleft, the idea was that the neurotransmitter would bind to a regulatory protein, which would be a receptor. Yes. And uh, at the time I proposed this idea, the receptors were not mm. identified. There was no uh, receptor for neurotransmitter ever identified. So the excitement here for me is that <clears throat> what seemed like a story that seemed like it had to be true in bacteria looking at real data and the real ability of bacterial organisms to regulate properly the level of an amino acid yeah. caused a paradigm shift that said, but if it's, it can't be just bacteria, perhaps this theme, this allosteric theme, works between cells of a variety of types to regulate them. And in fact, the nervous system in particular, how important it would be for the nervous system to regulate itself. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the next chapter because the next chapter is the nicotinic receptor. Yeah, well, the next chapter was uh, to test the idea. Mm. And I may say in, in scientific research, there are um, in general uh, two steps that uh, were emphasized by Claude Bernard already. One is uh, uh, making some kind of concept, some theoretical scheme or model, even perhaps a theory, and then doing experiments, mm. which either validate or invalidate the theory. Mm -hmm. So I had very briefly in my thesis and some work done after, uh, proposed that uh, uh, actually receptors for neurotransmitters would be allosteric proteins, mm. but there was no uh, receptor identified and no demonstration. Mm -hmm. So then I spent decades of my life mm. And even now, <laughs> to demonstrate that, uh, in fact, uh, one receptor that uh, uh, became the first to be identified, that we did in our lab, the nicotinic receptor from the neuromuscular junction, uh, was in fact an allosteric protein. And uh, the isolation was quite difficult uh, because the receptor was present in very small amount. Mm. And even pharmacologic thought at that time that uh, uh, no receptor would ever be uh, isolated. It was some kind of mysterious molecule. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the solution we found was to look at uh, an organ, the electric organ from fish, which was shown by David Nartmanson, with whom I, I did some postdoctoral uh, work. Uh, the uh, fish electric organ is extremely rich in cholinergic synapse or synapse working with acetylcholine and therefore very rich in receptor. Mm. And now uh, we had also to find a way to tag mm. the receptor, mm -hmm. how to identify mm. the, the protein which uh, bind acetylcholine. We could use acetylcholine, we could use curare, which is uh, well known, but they were not specific enough. And the solution came from uh, a snake venom toxin, mm -hmm. which was purified initially by Shen Yuan Li, a colleague from Taiwan, that I had the opportunity to, to meet. He came to visit my lab one day. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I have been doing, working with uh, toxin. I said, this is exactly what we need. Perfect. And we put together <coughs> the venom, the snake venom toxin and the electric organ for fish. They don't meet normally in nature, mm. but, but they meet in the test tube. Mm. And in the test tube, this was the answer. And the protein uh, was uh, uh, labeled, then identified, purified, and so on and so forth. So for the listeners, um, we're still studying this receptor. As yes, well as I am all still studying it, yes. Mm -hmm. And we're still using Bungra toxin to yes. bind these receptors yes. and follow them and Absolutely. watch their trafficking. So. How exciting that was. And, and so and then the next chapter, it seems to me, is a, is a chapter, <clears throat> you, you, might have, you might have confined yourself to simply pursuing terrific biochemistry and genetics, which you had been doing. Yeah. But it's gone beyond that. It's gone beyond it to say, not only are I'm looking at an intracellular activity, a regulatory event, not only am I looking activities that happen between cells, but I, I would like to understand how regulating neuronal activity creates awareness, the chemistry or the chemical processes of consciousness. And that's very exciting. It is Speak indeed. to that, please. Yeah, but first of all, uh, we are conscious. We are speaking so. to each other. <laughs> <laughs> but sometime in the evening, we are not conscious anymore, we sleep. Right. And uh, also, if we uh, have to undergo surgery, mm. uh, it's better that uh, we are not awake when the surgeon is trying to cut uh, our muscles. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a general anesthesia, which was discovered actually uh, at the end of the 19th century. And before that, all the surgery was done with su subjects which were uh, awake, mm -hmm. which was terrible. Mm. And uh, so it's an immense progress of, uh, of uh, medicine to the discovery of general anesthetics. And these general anesthetics control the state of consciousness. You lose consciousness when you are under mm -hmm. the treatment. Mm -hmm. 
of uh, general anesthetics. These are small molecules uh, which uh, have been much studied. And we know that the dose of general anesthetics put you asleep. How does it work? There must be some kind of chemistry of consciousness. Mm. And um, the idea, in short, is uh, that um, these general anesthetics are acting on receptors, which are analogous to the acetylcholine receptor I just mentioned. But in the case of uh, the acetylcholine receptor, you have the site for the neurotransmitter and the ion channel through which the ion goes through. So it's a chemoelectrical transduction. Now, there are homologues of the uh, nicotinic receptor, like the GABA-E receptor. Mm -hmm. So they are uh, a receptor for GABA, uh, which is uh, Uh, gamma amino butyric acid, which is an inhibitor neurotransmitter, in the sense that the receptor is linked to a chloride channel and inhibits. While in the case of the nicotinic receptor, there is activation and excitation. Mm. So inhibition. And now, very interestingly, the finding of uh, ourselves, our group, and other groups as well, is that uh, the general anesthetics are acting on the GABA receptor, not on the GABA site, mm -hmm. not on the ion channel, but on an allosteric site, mm -hmm. which regulates mm -hmm. the transition. That same concept that was discovered in bacteria applied to the brain. And to consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> And this is, uh, uh, therefore, an effect of potentiation of inhibition. When the general anesthetic is given to the patient, then it's, it's strong, his brain is strongly inhibited, and therefore it falls asleep. Mm. And uh, there is therefore uh, some kind of uh, allosteric modulation of the awake state mm -hmm. uh, of the patient. And now we can further develop some uh, theories about um, how does uh, this uh, uh, conscious processing in the brain takes place, that there are some neuronal architectures of, um, of uh, conscious access. And this uh, was done with uh, a former student of me, Stanislas Dehan, who became a colleague, and uh, we're still working together for more than 30 years now. <laughs> and um, the idea uh, that we propose is that they There is a long-range connectivity in the brain, which is uh, uh, involved. And if you think about uh, access to consciousness, uh, you are here looking at me. You are here hearing me. You are here thinking about the work uh, you have read before. Everything is stored, and everything is, is put in common mm -hmm. somewhere in our brain. Mm -hmm. And the simple idea we propose, and which seems to have some, uh, some validity, but maybe not sufficient, of course, is that um, there are neurons in our brain with long-range connection, which link different territories mm -hmm. of the brain, and make some kind of global neuronal workspace, mm -hmm. uh, where all these things are put together in one site, yes. or one Space, I should say, it's not only one side, it's mm -hmm. a space in our brain. Mm -hmm. And that's the hypothesis with which we are working. And um, of course, these uh, uh, are neurons, and uh, these neurons carry receptors, and they can be modulated by neurotransmitters and so on. It's a beautiful theory. It's a still a theory, mm -hmm. it's a still in progress, right. and uh, uh, this is interesting for. Uh, those who are uh, listening to us, it is something where the good students mm. should go there and work and, and be interested by the future of neuroscience. It is the future of neuroscience. Certainly understanding <clears throat> why we are the way we are, what we think about, understanding the very fundamental basis of thought, consciousness. Yes of our hopes, our desires, of our fears. This is, 
This is the ultimate territory for neuroscience. Absolutely, and also our, uh, not only our ability to reason, reasoning, mm. but uh, also our ability to interact mm. uh, with each other. Mm. Uh, and this is, I think, a very important aspect of uh, uh, the human brain is that it is not only rational, mm -hmm. but social. Mm -hmm. And this issue of social interaction is something which would, should also attract the interest of the neuroscientists in the future. And so if I'm gonna, <clears throat> if I'm gonna compare now to 1950, I wanna think that what we learn about our brain as an individual brain begins an exciting era of how do brains interact. Not just intrabrain, but interbrain. Absolutely. The social connection. Jean-Pierre, I'm so pleased that you came and on the show. We, we honor the, your work. We, uh, we honor the terrific work that you continue to do. And we thank you for being here with us today. Thank you very much. And thank you also for uh, me, for being in uh, uh, UCSD and uh, uh, specifically in the Kavli Institute for uh, Brain and Mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel and On Our Mind. Thanks for being with us and uh, stay tuned for other episodes.